buenos días a todos, a los presentes y a los que están conectados online en este seminario. Hoy es un placer para el Instituto contar con, con la presencia del profesor Juan de Dios Moreno Ternero, catedrático de la Universidad de la Universidad Pablo Laride. Eh, el profesor Moreno Ternero tiene una dilatada trayectoria científica, reconocida nacionalmente, con publicaciones en revistas como Econométrica y Mana de Science, además de que es editor jefe de Matemáticas Social Science. Entonces, hoy eh, nos va a a contar, nos va a dar un seminario cuyo título es eh, Incentivos sucesivos. Muchas gracias, tienes la palabra. Gracias, Martín. Eh, bueno, pues un placer volver a venir. Estaba echando cuenta, creo que fue hace poco más de cinco años, pero como el tipo se ha comprimido desde, desde la pandemia, la salió es que estuve aquí hace muy poco, ¿no? Pero es un placer estar aquí, muy cerca de donde se ha quedado otro lado derecho, o sea, que es casi como volver a la red. Bueno, eh, como el trabajo es en inglés, voy a presentar un inglés, ¿vale? So, uh, the, the, the title of the paper, as Joaquín said, is Successive Incentives. This is the, the news tab, I'd say, a research agenda in which I've been involved with my long-time uh, dear friends, uh, Jens Lethauer and uh, Lars Peter Ulstada from the both from Copenhagen. And we joined to the group this uh, junior, yes, who is uh, he's actually Swedish, uh, not Danish, but working in, in Denmark too, to the other side of the Orson River, right, in the southern Sweden. But the three of them uh, work in Copenhagen, which happened to be the place where I spent part of my PhD uh, years, and that's how we started collaborating. Uh, we've been working together in several uh, research areas, but in this particular case, our motivation came from a very nice story that we discovered in a paper published in Science in 2011, but it refers to a story that dates back to 2009, late 2009, so it's uh, 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, there's this uh, agency in the US, it's called the Defense Advanced Research Project uh, Agency, it's, it's, it's uh, in short the DARP um, agency, which for those of you who might uh, be aware of, is, is ultimately responsible for the beginning of the internet, right? Uh, this, this agency has been conducted, uh, conducting uh, research for, you know, uh, future interesting issues. And in particular, 15 years ago, you know, for those of you who are much younger, uh, this was a different world. We didn't have cell phones as we have today. Internet was already working, but not at the level as, as it is today. And they wanted to test how fast we could mobilize people to do something. So that was the that was the purpose of this of this experiment. And to do that, they did something very very nice uh, to to our understanding. Let me let me tell you about it. So the experiment was to um, uh, provide ten big red balloons all over the U.S. So they were uh, leaving these balloons in different locations and they wanted to test how fast people were able to find this location, the precise location. Uh, we're talking about what's called contiguous U.S., so it's continental U.S., forget about Hawaii or Alaska or small islands, right? So we're just talking about, you know, from, from, from New York to California, so to speak. Yeah, this is a huge area and um, so this is a challenging issue to, to be able to find these, these precise locations. So you don't do things in the US without money, so they offer a price that was $40,000 uh, $40, for those who are able to com complete this challenge faster, okay? And it turns out, um, and this is reported in this, in this paper in science, a group from MIT, no surprise, you know, big brains from MIT won the challenge. But the interesting thing is how they did it. They did it in, in, in less than nine hours. In less than nine hours, they were able to find the exact locations of these 10 red balloons all over the US. How did they do this? And this is the interesting thing in how we started working on this. They did it by means of a very interesting uh, mechanism, which works as follows. These guys normally don't need the money. So they use the money to recruit people. So 10 balloons, 40,000, Easy math, 4,000 per balloon. So they decided to give this 4,000 per balloon. But instead of giving the whole price to those finding the balloon, 
Then it started different. They gave only half, 2,000 to those finding the balloon. To the guy finding the, to the guy who pulled in the same location, this guy obtained 2,000. But the guy who recruited the one finding the location obtained 1,000. And the recruiter of the recruiter obtained 500, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that was the interesting thing to us, this sort of recursive mechanism or successive mechanism, so to speak, that takes me back to the time for that. Okay? Uh, so this um, recursive is something, is something that is not completely out of the blue. Uh, again, for those of you who are as old as me, you may remember that when we were kids, there was this, this uh, the so-called Tupperware technology, right? That started becoming popular, and you have normally housewives selling this stuff. At their, at their, I mean, uh, you know, back in the in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, in Spain, it was different different country. So most of the female were not accessing the labor market yet. They were staying home, and some of them found the possibility of making some money for the household income by means of selling this. Tupperware. And the way we spend it was normally by commission in a very similar way to this kind of mechanism. Right? You were recruiting people, and these people were making money, and you as a recruiter were making money yourself. This also happened for cosmetics. This, 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 this uh, so called Avon, I believe, this, this is the term that also works in this way. Right? So this is it's a way of, of trying to entice other people selling the good. It's, it's, it's something that is normally Consider nowadays as multi level marketing. I'll get back to that later. Anyhow, so then what I wanted to say is that this, this DARPA network challenge, we call it, uh, motivated a uh, you know, huge mixture, a tremendous mixture of them with this. Um, you know, I, I already mentioned this, how we discovered this in this paper in science about these social mobilization systems. Uh, but you have this multi level marketing that I mentioned as well. Some of you may be familiar with this tool to the so called Amazon Mechanical Turk. You know, Amazon offers this uh, service by which you can offer jobs. And I, you were talking before about exams, and you don't want to grade many exams, right? So you offer the possibility that people grade the exams for you, especially in the US, you get these TAs, making some money out of some of this. Or, you know, you name other activities in, in, in some of things or whatever, you get off these possibilities and people make money out of it. So this is also, uh, Amazon is using a very similar mechanism to the one we're considering here. And of course, cryptocurrencies. It seems that by now people don't talk about them anymore, but 10 years ago, this was the new big thing, right? Now it's artificial intelligence. So we're moving every year to a new big thing, but there was a big thing, Bitcoin, like five, six, 10 years ago, right? Again, very much connected to that, right? You have this uh, pyramidal scheme that's in a, in a different financial, financial economics that we, we talk about it. So there's a, there's a lot of literature dealing with this. You see, most of it is outside economics, it's computer science or some borderline discipline. We come from economics. So we thought that probably we had something to say uh, from an economics viewpoint to this, to this problem. Why? Because economists and social scientists alike have been Low concern with this issue of insanity. Right? When you talk about economics, you know, the probably first one that comes to mind is insanity. Well, we talk about prices, we talk about scarcity, but insanity is you know, deeply connected with the notion of, with, with the field of economics. And you can go all the way back to a century ago, right? You already have papers in economics and management talking about how school boards should be you know, designed, taking into account incentives. And early school, but also taxes. And we keep talking about how taxes distort the incentives. And in you know, marketing, right? Uh, you know, marketing is full of, of incentives. You know, let me have a parenthesis here. About 20 years ago or so, behavioral economics was the new big thing in economics, experimental slash behavioral economics. And there were these experiments that became very famous because uh, they were having these, for instance, these schools in the US, they were offering, you know, when, when in the U.S., kids have lunch in school, right? And then if you offer to the kid the healthy dishes at the front, it turns out they get to select these healthy dishes more than the others. You just reverse the order. To me, that was like reinventing the wheel, right? Because, you know, 
every time you go to the airport, right, you cross the duty free section before you get into the into your boarding gates, precisely, you know, encourage you to be uh, um, biased that from there, right? So, that, so people in marketing knew about this way before economists discovered the new big thing with behavioral economics. Anyhow, this is all to say that incentives is all that matters in economics. And we would like to pay attention to it in a successive way in which this is concerned. For instance, you know, uh, taking you closer to home in economics back in the 70s, there were these crucial papers that were dealing with, with, with teams, right? With organizational aspects of firms or, you know, uh, production uh, ventures, so to speak. And, and in particular, you know, also, you know, Nobel Prize winner, were very much concerned with the informational aspects associated to this, with the incentives associated to handling teams. Okay? It is, it is very much connected to what we're saying here. And again, nowadays, it's all about artificial intelligence and the new stacks. So it seems that there's increasing importance to probably revisit all these problems that we already address in economics to this new paradigm, to this new framework that we're observing um, nowadays with the new era that we are living. Okay. Now, uh, this is also an important thing to address here. You know, incentives can be uh, considered in many ways, but we're going to be concentrated on this idea of having sequential incentives. Again, very much familiar in across uh, the spectrum, right? So think about uh, the automobile industry or in general, large-scale industrial manufacturing. So you have a sequential process in general, right? Clinical trial, you know, your name. You have it here a lot of uh, aspects we, we do observe these incentive schemes, incentive uh, uh, sequential incentive schemes that appear all the time. And again, getting to closer uh, situations nowadays, I was referring to cryptocurrencies, to Bitcoin, this, this issue of mining in, in blockchain is very much connected to the example that I provided at the beginning of having this sequentiality of offering the right incentives along the chain. So that, that's what I uh, what I want to uh, frame for, for this paper. Um, okay. This concatenated decisions is going to be crucial in my, in my problem here. But before I get into the modeling itself, let me also mention this that might be closer to those of you working on game theory. There's also this well-known literature starting from the 70s dealing with a fair division in networks, right? So we have to allocate some resources, and agents are uh, organized in some sort of network, okay? This is very similar to the, uh, to the problem that underlies behind what I was introducing before, right? I have here some standard uh, <coughs> references to that you might be familiar uh, with, uh, all, all the on and the like. Okay, now, how do we approach this problem? We can make it in two different ways. The first one, uh, which is not indeed the main part of this presentation, is when we assume that uh, the structure of the process, so to speak, is exogenous. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is that agents are organized according to some sort of hierarchy. Let me call it this way, okay? Or, or an network, as I said before. In, in the simple scale, suppose agents are in a line, located along the line. So we have the boss at the top, and all the way down to the bottom. Think of a law firm, for instance, right? So we have the associates giving the name to the firm itself, and then you go down the ladder all the way down to this junior lawyer coming from law school that's working 24 hours, essentially, not making that much money, but being an essential part of the uh, process in itself, right? It could be more general than that. But let's, for the time being, let's assume we have this line of individual, this, this um, structure of command, so to speak, by which being at the top means something, right? And at the same time, each individual along the line, along the hierarchy, has not only a location, but also a revenue that brings to the overall range, okay? As I said, it may well be the case that being at the top, you just give the name to the firm itself, but you, should, you don't happen to be working 
on a daily basis. But you're only astonished because without you laying the framework that exists, right? Probably the guy working more is the guy at the bottom. But so be it. All we're saying is that we'll have individuals here located along the line, each of them bringing revenue to the uh, venture, the joint venture as a whole. And then the issue here is to decide how to distribute the overall revenue that we are obtaining in the venture. Okay? So, uh, a problem so defined, promise is the group of individuals located along the line and the revenue profile, uh, encompassing all the revenues they, they bring to the, to the firm. For each of these problems, we want to associate an allocation. So, a rule. A rule is just going to be a mapping associated to each problem, a vector indicating how much each, each agent is going to get out of these revenues. So the only condition we impose from the outset is that we are efficient in the process. Okay, we fully allocate everything we have. So one possibility is to say, do nothing, right? Less and fair. You bring your revenue, that's your revenue, end of the story. That's a possibility. The identity is a possibility within this domain, right? Or you could also have another extreme situation in which you transfer everything to the boss, fully confiscate, if you will, right? That's another possibility. You may want to have something in between, something in between, something in between like this. Let me describe this family here. This is the formal definition. Let me, let me explain it in words. This is what we call transfer rules. What do these uh, rules do? These rules set a proportion, a ratio, right? A percentage, if you want, of revenue that each individual is going to keep for his own, right? So lambda between zero and one. I'm going to keep 20%. And I'm going to transfer up 80%, right? Now, my process on the hierarchy, my immediate boss, if you come this way, is going to get this 80%, put it together with the revenue that he or she is producing, and take 20% of the whole pie, okay? Because 20% is, 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 is the parameter that I fixed at the beginning. And I do all the way up to the bottom. The bottom, sorry, up to the top. The top, the boss, the boss keeps the receiver. Okay? That's the idea. This is formally what this is saying. As I said, lambda can be anything between zero and one. If lambda is one, that's the identity. You keep everything for you, and that's the example that I get at the beginning. The no transfer rule. If lambda, on the other hand, is equal to one, the fully confiscating uh, rule in which you transfer everything to the to the top, right? You keep nothing. Is that clear? If I say one half, I precisely have the MIT rule that I described before. So remember, in that case, um, let me probably write it here. So in that particular case, I had. One balloon, right? That was giving me four thousand, and it was uh, uh, located by this individual at the bottom of the hair. The last one, the hair was the one picking. But this guy was peculiar, so this is agent M. But this guy was peculiar by agent M minus one. Agent M minus one by himself was bringing zero to the to the hair to the revenue. So the value was only generated by the last one, and that happened for all the others, right? But they were all crucial to recruit this individual. Without the structure in itself, this individual wasn't recruited in the first place, right? So these are the revenues. This is R1 in my model here. Mm -hmm. This is Ra minus 2, Ra minus 1, Ra, right? And now what I have to say is how much each one is going to be getting, the X. And I said before that this guy was getting 2,000. So this is my Xn. This guy was getting 1,000, right? This is the Xn minus one, and so on and so forth, right? So what I'm saying is that taking this, this uh, idea, I am selecting, oh, did I, sorry. Okay, I, yes, I was here. So what I was saying is that I keep one half, of my revenue to me, and I transfer out to my predecessor of 2000, the other half. This guy adds two half, uh, that, that half 2000 with zero, and keeps one half, that's 1000, and continues doing that. 
Okay, so that's that's our opinion. Okay. I'm not going to present because this disappeared in another paper that is already published. I'm, I'm not going to tell you but the results, technically speaking, but we do characterize this family. We, we consider some axioms that take us to this family and provide normative foundation for this family. So, so the MIT group was showing to us that this group was effective in, 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 in the challenge. We're saying that there are normative considerations that can be added to say that this rule is superior to the other ones. Within within a specific specific domain, okay. Now, this is just one attempt of rationalizing this, this this nice story that we discovered with the balloons and these incentive uh, uh, mechanisms. But there's something here that we uh, found a bit less interesting than we wanted, and it's the fact that we were assuming in this model. That the hierarchy was given, was exogenous, right? So we want to take the process one step here and make it endogenous, make the, the process of recruiting people some part of the analysis. And that's what we're hoping to do in this, in this segment. Okay? So, in this new model, we're going to imagine this dynamic process by which individuals invest resources to recruit others to the process, okay? So I don't know, think of these startup companies, you have seed money, right? You put money, and part of this money is to recruit some others that follow you in the process. So this is about, I'm not even gonna call it hierarchy, but you can think of that, but it doesn't need to be a hierarchy. So it's just a, what we call a value generating process. The more people we bring to the process, the more value we add. We simplify things assuming that all individuals bring the same value. So all individuals are equally talented. We have a pool of equally talented individuals and we want to select out of them. But of course, we have to incentivize this process. Okay? And here the idea is that if I recruit someone to the process, I'll be assuming that this person will be recruiting himself someone else to continue the process. And that's the idea. Okay? I mean, in a sense, this is similar to what we do in science, right? So we normally say that we stand on the shoulders of giants because when we start doing research, we normally follow the footsteps of some others that did research in the first place. So, so it's all some sort of continuing process that generates value. And the whole point is to continue uh, extending the process. Okay? Now, of course, there's some random component here, there's a probability. Uh, of being successful with your investment. You invest to bring someone and you may be successful or not, right? So this probability, you may call it technology, this is the technology of our production, if you will, right? So this probability will obviously depend on this amount of research. The more I invest, the more likely that I am successful to bring this individual into the process. But it is important, it is important that this probability will always be bounded above. So I cannot guarantee probability one, even if I invest infinite amounts of money. There's always a possibility of failure, so to speak, in the process. That, that's, that's crucial for our analysis. Okay? But of course, if, if I'm successful, I get a reward. Okay? And the reward in the fact that I said before that this individual will be transferring something to you, and not only this individual, but also the other that this individual will be recruiting himself to the, to the process. Okay? But of course, these, these rewards that are added to the process can be reallocated in principle in many ways. And this is going to be our instrument to formalize these incentives. Okay? So, we're going to have what we call allocation schemes or allocation rules that say how to spread this value that we add to the process. And this is the way in which we can incentivize agents to invest themselves into the process. Okay? So, formally speaking, we're going to have this, what we call initiator, this startup company, right? This, 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 this founder, so to speak. Uh, and a pool of potential agents. At the end of the day, I'm going to have this 
investment profile indicating how much each individual is investing. Number zero refers to the initiator, again, zero is the initiator, or the other side of the agents that are with the other tree. Okay. Um, you will see that it's, it's going to be very relevant to highlight those profiles made of constant investments, profiles in which all of the invest the same. You will see that they will be optimal in, in, a, in, a, in a given way. Okay, that's why I will introduce this notation here. The bar, the bar is the first, the fact that we have. Constant, constant investments. As I said at the beginning, this probability technology function is going to be bounded above, right? So there's an epsilon, so that this probability is bounded above by one minus epsilon. If I invest zero, I get zero. That's clear, right? But if I invest huge amounts, I get close to one, but never, never uh, touch one. This success rate, probability, or whatever you want, technology, whatever you call it, is going to be common for all individuals and it's fixed. So it's no, it's a prior of the all. We all know that. Uh, and we have some regularity conditions for it. What do we impose this probability function? It's going to be increasing, it's going to be differentiable, it's going to be concave in the investment. Um, and it's, it's, it, we're going to have the derivative is going to go to infinite when, when the amount of goes to zero, which is also very standard. And we also have this extra condition that seems to be obscure. I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, a rationale for that for that later. But it was something we, we discovered in the analysis. We didn't expect this. Uh, what we're saying is that the, the ratio between the probability and its derivative is going to be convex. Why? I'll explain. Give me a few minutes and I'll get back to that. But that's another condition that we impose. Otherwise, our results don't work. And I'll show you that later. Okay, bit more notation. So, given a profile of investments, so I, I have a vector of, of investments that were um, uh, associated with each of the divisions in the process. This will go the expected investment. So, what do we have here? So, this is the investment of the initiator, and this is the investment of each agent along the line, providing they become part of the process. And that's why we need this probability here, right? Because they, you have these successive probabilities, right? With probability P of X0, A0 is successful, right? But then for the next one, A1, you need P of X0 and P of X1. So it's this, this joint probability that you happen to be able to move the process another step down, and so on and so forth. That's the close form uh, expression for the expected investment. As I said, each individual that is recruited to the person brings value. We normalize this to one because we assume all of these are equally valuable. And that's why we can define this expected value. Expected value is the counterpart of the expected investment. But instead of talking about the amount they invest, we talk about the amount they bring as value. So it's one for each of the individuals, right? So that's why you have this expression here. And of course, it, I mean, this, this could be infinite, right? This could go all the way down. So this might not be converging, but if they are converging, if they are both converging, I can talk about the difference between the value and the investment, and it's what we call the wealth, the expected wealth associated with the process. Okay? So that's just notation. Now, once I introduce this, I can already formulate the first question that normally comes to mind in this process, and it's how do we maximize this value? Okay? So we invest in profile is socially optimal. By socially optimal, we mean that we uh, maximize the social value associated to the process. And it turns out that there's this, uh, this is how we see from the beginning that, that constant profiles are going to be very important in this analysis. What this first result is saying is that for each profile that is non-constant, you see, belongs to x minus x bar, there is a constant profile such that the value is the same, and the investment, the investment is slower. So you can achieve the same value with a constant profile investing less. So constant profiles are going to be optimal. And making use of that, so if you use a constant profile in the expression that I gave you before, they simplify a lot, and you can easily obtain the welfare associated to a constant profile, which is actually equal to this expression here, right? 
and then you can identify the so-called first best investment, right? So this 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 amount C F B F B stands for first best is the level that all leaders would be investing constantly to guarantee that we achieve the uh, maximum possible welfare. Okay, and this is obtained from this. this. So there is a very uh, it's, it's a somewhat easy result, but a very natural uh, first step to be given in this in this analysis. Okay. Now uh, we're not that much interested into into this. We're actually interested into into offering the right incentives to be able to uh, manage to handle this this process. And the instrument that we're going to be using for this is what we call an allocation model. Okay, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be talking about Santa, so I'm going to be introducing a game. So the game is going to be introduced by means of this allocation rules. So allocation proof is simply a mapping that allocates, fully allocates the value that we create for any realization of the agents. So for instance, suppose that the process stops at K. So I was able to recruit K individuals, right? Together with the with the initiator, that means that we have K plus one in the process. It means that overall the value of the process is scaled remember the normalization. So the whole point is to say how much each AE is getting out of this K plus one, right? With the caveat that nobody gets a negative amount. Okay? The worst I can do with one individual is to give this individual zero. So what kind of rules can we think of? But a focal one is some equal split. You split equally this value, okay? But you split equally this value, okay? Among all successful agents, successful means that I was able to repeat someone myself, right? So this first place, which is the, the initial nothing to, to say. In this second second row, we have the case in which the, the initiator was successful, but the second was not. So then I give everything to the initiator. What happens here? Yeah, I was able to get the third one. So both the first and the second were successful. They get one each, plus the extra one at the beginning. The extra one at the beginning is, is what the initiator himself was bringing. So there was nothing to discuss. And that's the, the expression in SQL Spring. Okay, that's one possibility, and it's very natural. But you could think of others, right? There are other possible rules. For instance, this second rule is the rule that only rewards the agent that was last to succeed. Forget about the split. I was the last one succeeding. I'm the one keeping everything. I get a jackpot, so to speak, right? This is what you get. It's another possibility. Uh, or you could have this, uh, for instance, kind of funny uh, example that we use in one of the examples in the paper that I'll skip. But let me just mention it here as another example. This is the rule that shares the incremental value equally between the initiator, the successful, and the new way. Okay, so like a, it's like a, I give part of the report to the last one that came, even though this last one wasn't successful in celebrating someone else, right? So what I'm saying here is that I, I, I'm, I'm splitting in three this last, right? The initial so I did, I use some sort of uh, part of the price to the, to the boss, and most keeps for always one half, one third, sorry, the last successful gets that as a reward of being successful, and the very last individual gets as a bonus to be part of the process also gets this. That's another possibility. Okay, you can think of many, and and, and that's just to illustrate that uh, we we are not we, we are minimalistic on the conditions that we impose for these reward rules, and these reward rules can be as complex as you want. So we're going to be very general in our analysis with the hope to see whether without putting restrictions uh, on the way in which we design these rules, we're able to fine tune our incentives. That's the idea. Okay. But one thing that I'd like to stress is that each time, each time I set a rule in which we allocate the value, we create a game, we generate a game. What's the game? You know, it's, you know, for my three years, <laughs> so there are three elements for the games, players, actions, and payoffs, right? So here are the players, the players will be all, all the agents that participate in the process, right? The acts, their actions is the amount they invest, how much they invest, 
right? And the package is how much they get, which is determined by this world. So each world board is generating a new gain, in which they're going to decide how much they invest if they are recruiting from the process. That's the idea. So based on that, I could introduce this notation here. I'll try to digest this notation, but it's important to frame the discussion that comes now. So in particular, this, this notation here, ui x higher or equal than y f. This is the expected gross payoff, or utility you prefer, excluding my own investment as aging i, conditional on the situation, conditional the fact that I was recruited. So if I was recruited, what am I going to do now? OK, there's a probability that by investing xi, I am successful. OK, that's p of, X, of xi. And the, and the complement is the probability that I'm not successful. So if I'm not successful, I just get this much that the rule says to me. The process starts with me, and the last one, and the rule says how much I get. End of the story. But if I am successful, the process continues. Okay? And this, this amount, sorry. <laughs> and this amount, <laughs> it's, uh, I'll explain now what I would be expecting from the process if the process continues. And this is the, of course, this is the investment that I was putting myself. So you have to subtract that. So overall, this is my expected uh, gross, gross payoff. Now, this RI is the expected return that I'll be getting from the process. And again, what do you have here? You have the probability that the process is successful after me and down the road, okay? All the way up until the last moment in which an individual is not successful, which happens with this probability. So you multiply all these probabilities that you're successful in the upcoming processes, upcoming steps. This is the last time in which you're not successful. And this is what you get where the process finishes. This is what the rules tells you once the process finishes there, okay? And of course, and, and, and you aggregate because you can, you, can, you can start all the way after you. So this is all the possibilities that you have in here. So this is just basic expected utility, OK? And, and just the last line, just to know that the overall worth of the process is the expected gross payoff of the initiator plus this, uh, this sort of weighted aggregation of all the expected gross of the other individuals that follow the initial process. That's just basic algebra. I don't need there. Just, just to close this, this slide here. So that's the game. And of course, if we have a game, we'd like to be able to find the equilibrium or equilibria of this game. And this is our first important result. Well, first, first of all, uh, you know, an equilibrium of this game, a nice equilibrium of this game is a pair made of a, an investment profile and a rule because the rule itself determines the game, so that each agent is selecting the investment, maximizing this uh, expected payoff, expected utility, right? So it's a standard definition of the Nash equilibrium concept, okay? Um, it's not a sequential, uh, it's not sanctity perfect equilibrium because it's not a, a sequential game in the sense that you are making your decision at the given steps so it's, it's a simultaneous game, although there's this structure of a, of, a, of, a, of a successive process, but you are making your choice at each step simultaneously. Okay, so uh, the first result that we have here is that for each group you can think of, the resulting game will have an equilibrium. So there is, for each rule, there is a profile so that the pair is an equilibrium. So in other words, existence of equilibria is guaranteed for each, for each group. Now, one thing is the existence of the equilibrium, the profile itself. Another thing is how we support this equilibrium. In other words, for a given, for a given profile, you may have more than one rule that support this equilibrium. Okay. So once you have the rule, there's, there's, there's a game and there's an equilibrium. But what I'm saying is that you could have different games emerging from different um, uh, allocation rules that would be having the same investment profile as a game. And, and this is uh, uh, some of the consequences that I'm going to be showing now. And uh, how am I doing with the time? 
Okay, so I'll be rushing back uh, from here. So just a, just a few, um, a few follow-up uh, points from, from this result. So in particular, one interesting thing is that uh, this, this equilibrium, we can, find, we can determine some bounds for this equilibrium. So in particular, for the initiator, we know that this initiator will be investing less than the first 20%. Remember, this first best was the amount that we were obtaining by maximizing the overall value without taking into account incentives or anything. The maximum we can achieve. And for this gain, the initiator is benefiting investing less. Or if you socially speaking, there is underinvestment from the uh, initiator's viewpoint. Right? So if, if you think of the initiator of the one setting the rules of the game, the initiator is, is, is winning by doing that, as opposed to the centralized approach to the problem, which we fully maximize the overall value. And, and you know, I explain this with specific rule. Uh, you can actually uh, also obtain that all other individuals apart from the initiator overinvest. So it may well be the case that setting a game the initiator benefits by investing less and actually punishes to compensate the followers by investing more. Okay, so that, that's, that's one of the messages here, but that seems to be natural. Uh, what else? Um, if, if you think of this, if you think of this, uh, uh, let, let me, so probably, yeah, probably I'll, I'll, I'll give you the most important results. Apart from finding that there's overinvestment or underinvestment, you can actually uh, obtain the equilibrium that maximizes the uh, social welfare. So, so okay, uh, we are now in a decentralized world in the sense that the uh, initiator or a planet is setting this allocation rule, and individuals are going to be making decisions themselves. That's there's a game and there's an equilibrium. And we'd like to be able to find the equilibrium that maximizes the equilibrium of the game that maximizes wealth. Now, okay? But again, I say this, this is the decentralized optimal uh, investment profile as opposed to the centralized first best optimal profile. Well, it turns out that we can fully obtain this optimal investment. So the result is that the pair of this investment, a cost of investment, and a rule are the uh, equilibrium that maximizes welfare among all equilibria, okay? So, you can see that this is a constant. So the way in which I can probably present this better is by saying, suppose we fix the solution to this condition here that gives you a value, specific, uh, real number. Now take that real number that happens to be between zero and one. Remember that our investments we're supposed to be between zero and one, although this bound doesn't need to be enforced, right? But it turns out this investment replicated throughout the process, that constant profile in which everybody invests the same is going to be the equilibrium supported by this rule, okay? This is the rule essentially in which the initiator keeps the value, right? And the value is transferred to the previous, uh, individual in the process. That's essentially what this is saying. Okay? So, by this we find optimal equilibrium and maximum social welfare, but at the same time, but at the same time, they can be supported in several ways. This is one possibility, but you could find other allocation groups in, in which you could support the same. So, in other words, the, the, the result, as, as we did with the previous one, is providing uniqueness for the investment profile, but not for the rule supporting this investment profile. And then the investment profile could be supported by several rules. And in particular here, I, I have a whole family of rules that would uh, guarantee the same equilibrium being supported. Uh, one common pattern that all these rules we have to support an equilibrium is that um, individuals don't keep anything to themselves, okay? So uh, the, the condition is that apart from the initiator, none of the individuals keep anything of their investment, 
right? So it's, it's actually optimal to invest that on the uh, uh, on the possibility that you continue the process downwind. So that's that's something common to to this work. But again, I say this is just to illustrate that there's not a unique rule uh, supporting the equilibrium profile that I was presenting in the in the previous lecture. Okay, that, that's, that, that's one main result in which we explore the optimality, uh, but this optimality notion can be challenged. So instead of being concerned with maximizing the overall welfare along the process, you may be concerned with maximizing the expected return of the initiator. Why? Because you might think of the initiator as the one being in charge of setting the game. The initiator is the one you know, funding the startup and setting the rules, so to speak, for the process. If that is the case, the initiator would be interested in to know what's the optimal way of maximizing uh, profits there, right? So in that case, uh, instead of being concerned with maximizing value, we're going to be maxima uh, concerned with maximizing U0, right? U0 is the expected utility of the initiator. And again, we have a an analogous result in this one in which we identify a pair, an equilibrium of, of the game maximizing the expected uh, utility or pair for the, for the initiator. In this case, it's a bit more uh, sophisticated, but the, uh, the idea is very similar. It is that, as opposed to the previous one, you're going to now set a semi constant profile. By semi constant, I mean that the initial is going to invest something, and all the others are going to invest something, something different. This happens to be the optimal uh, profiling here. Now, these specific amounts that they transfer are obtained from these conditions. These conditions are just first of all the conditions of an optimization problem in which you, you formalize the expected welfare of each of the individuals in the process all the expected welfare of the initiator. Okay, so these conditions come from here. Uh, and the rule supporting the rule supporting this equilibrium is a rule in which again the initiator keeps everything, right? Uh, you don't obtain anything if you stop the process. And in between, you get this ratio obtained from these conditions. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat ad hoc. Uh, reward rule, but the important thing is to be able to find a rule that supports the equilibrium itself, which is what we have for which we have uniqueness here. Okay, so those those were the main the main results that I that I wanted to uh, to mention. Uh, let me also get back to something that I said in passing that there was this additional condition for the probability function that the ratio between the probability and the, and the derivative was was um, was concave, uh, sorry, was, was convex, and this was essential for our results. Without this convexity, we can have, we can have um, a pair, so we can have a, an investment profile and a reward rule so that the pair is an equilibrium, but for which there's no other rule so that the constant profile associated to this one, giving the same value, becomes an equilibrium. Okay, so, so this optimality of constant profiles is pretty much driven by the fact that we have this condition here. Okay? And this condition is, is, is a sort of saying that the returns from the investments down the road are not too high. And that's pretty much where it was. Or they don't increase too fast. That, that's pretty much, pretty much the idea. Okay, so uh, I, can, I can probably discuss a few more things, but, but let, me, let me wrap up here by saying that the, the motivation was to study these successive incentives, and we have this naive way of rationalizing this MIT mechanism by assuming that the hierarchy was given and exogenous. But the more challenging burden of making this endogenous to the process and dealing with the with the with the recruitment in itself was, was what we tried to do in here. And you could say that, that this, this uh, canonical version of this model can, can work out for this multi-level marketing, but uh, a more interesting uh, view, I'd say, of this, of this work would be to say that we, we have this very, very maximalized model, because it's, you know, 
which is many things for real life, obviously, but we can, we're able to capture these necessary incentives in sharing rules to have these evolving or sequential processes, right? Maximizing the total profits of the process or the profits of the initiative, right? And, and I didn't say so, but we could also extend this resource in the case in which these investments are self-sustainable, right? So you don't allow indigenous to invest as much as they want, they'll be uh, bounded above by the amount they're able to recruit from the cost. They cannot invest more than that. If so, we can extend the process. I mean, there's just some obviously technical complications there, but we can we can have the same features in the in the results. Um, and that's I mean another thing I didn't bring it to the to the slide. Another thing you could you could uh, bring as a result in here is that um, this this reward groups that I presented in the model are very very general. Right, so we have a lot of freedom to, to set these, these rules. But potentially, you could say that it makes sense for us to have only simpler rules, right? You know, there's, there's all this literature in contract theory in economics claiming that in real life we observe simpler contracts than those we study in, 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 in theory. Why so, right? Of course, there's, there's another side of it that, that, you know, the world needs to be simpler and we don't have individuals able to process it's very complex. But you no, know, in these multinational companies, in these big companies, you have sometimes these very weird contracts, especially CEOs and, and guys at the top sign, right? With these bonuses, these stock options and the like, right? You know, there was this funny, uh, I cannot resist to say something about football with Joaquin Fiala. Yeah. <laughs> so there was this, this funny story with Mbappé before being transferred to Madrid. So a few years ago, everybody was assuming that he was coming to Madrid. But in the last minute, he decided to stay in Paris. Apparently, he did because the contract he signed to extend uh, his participation in Paris was kind of He was taking you know, all the money from these this petrodollars, right? whatever you call it. The, the Madrid supporters keep blaming uh, the petrodollars. Uh, uh, they forget that they did the same for a century again in Spain, right? Exploring mm -hmm. the, the, the resources they have uh, as opposed to the US finances. But anyhow, being as a the guy was making a lot of money. But part of the contract was having this clause by which he was making extra 40 million just for staying, right? And, but these 40 million were only going to be obtained in the very last year of the extension of the contract. So it turns out the guy said nothing, got this 40 million, and a few days they said, I'm not staying in part. <laughs> so, you know, these very complex times, you know, might not be necessary. So why am I saying this? Because in principle, you could think of the restrictive model in which rather than assuming that reward rules are too complex, just have simple reward rules in which you only allow for our transfers in the air defines. That's a possibility. Well, it works out, restricting those rules to those uh, to that domain, you can still have pretty much the same results. So one side effect of this analysis is that simple contracts, ensuring incentives in the short run might be able to guarantee incentives in the long run. That, I mean, I didn't have time to properly develop this message, but that's one of the most interesting messages we believe that we have in here. That simplicity works sometimes, and that this short-term incentives might be enough for the long run. So dealing with the short run might be enough. So sometimes, you know, for instance, for startup companies and the like, they don't think so much ahead in the future. They just look at the immediate steps. If you're successful in the very first steps, chances are you continue down the road. Of course, the world is much more complex because we were discussing the day with Facebook, for instance. So apparently, Facebook is for all people by now, right? Like me, not well, <laughs> me, but but in general, yeah, new generations don't use Facebook anymore, right? There are other things in the future, of course. Facebook saw that coming and acquired uh, Instagram some years ago, for instance, because they saw that coming. So, of course, you have to adjust. There are always, you know, discontinuities down the road. The problem the message is that to succeed as a startup company, you have to be crucially dealing with the first steps, the incentives at the beginning of the chain. Because when you do so, going down the road, things might be fine. Things might be fine. In which conditions matter. And I close with this. 
This university, I'm not going to say it, university. My home university was built such as at the same time as this one. But also the same time, the same time as Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. Okay? It was the same time with different initial conditions. By now, Pompeo Fabra is here, and my university keeps me in the same place that it was. What is that? Condition, initial conditions matter, right? And those of you who have some exposure to differential equations and all this very well. So this is probably a number side message here. Uh, I don't know if time was up or but I was fine. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, fine. Okay. 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 So, any questions or comment? For the people? No comment? No comment. Okay. Uh, well, I, yes, I have uh, a couple of comments or questions. It's not about Mbappé, right? Not about Mbappé. Not, not about Mbappé. 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 I, I, I'm very interested in okay. Mbappé, but I'm not about Mbappé. No, is is in one of your results is about the, the the optimal strategy for maximizing the the, the social world because you consider that is a condition about the derivative of of the the probability function. Yes, is is I think is deep prime. Yes, C equal to one in a sense. Yes, 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 yes. So, is uh, what is the the, 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 the meaning of that in, in the, this context because it's very clear to me that uh, that condition because right right because because if if, if it's going to be a constant profile yeah right this is going to be the amount that everybody's going to be investing right and you want to look for the amount that maximizes your expected payout so this is just the first order condition and if, of the optimization problem yeah, of okay. the so, yeah, okay. it, it only comes from the set. So, it, of course, you're right, but I put it this way because that's what we reflect, connect to the big, to the yeah, notation yeah. at the beginning, the, the one over P prime. Yeah, yeah, about the other because uh, eventually the next results are going to be multiplying this by P, and that's precisely the G function that I wanted to be complex. Okay. But of course, I could have just said that this is equal to. Yeah, because it's the function of And the other thing is, well, in your world, yes. is you try to, to, to recruit. People one by one. Yes. Yes, but maybe uh, I don't know. But uh, sometimes you can divide your investment right between several. Right. 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 Well, sometimes it's, it's not efficient, but right. maybe right. They, they are, they are, they, well, it's just a question. It's the third yes. point yes. in which they just choose. I don't know four new possible candidates. Is right. much better than one or much better than five. It's, yes, it's just an idea. Yes, yes. Um, you know, in, in, in the first part of the presentation, I was talking about this exogenous model. Yeah. It was the the the, the hierarchy was a line, was a line. Yeah. But we do have results for more general hierarchies, in which instead of a line, you can have branches. Yeah. And, and even you can have joint ownerships, in which one individual is working for more than two. So in real life. You can be indeed investing in different projects, yeah. right? Recruiting some for this, some for this, and some for that. That kind of strategy, I mean, that, that kind of model, to be more precise, requires more significant studies than we're going to do with the game yeah. the process. But it's a very natural uh, new step yeah. is to say, well, what if what if we have these different projects still sequential and we would like to be handling them simultaneously? So then you would be investing into probably recruiting one from here, one for that, and so on. Yeah, it's uh, maybe the result. Maybe, 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 maybe it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. the proofs, the proofs for this, even for this very small, the proofs were were not easy. So I, I would imagine that you know enriching the model in that way might render things untractable. Maybe not. Maybe 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 the, the main features are already captured here. In in, in the case of the Solidus network, actually the results were more complex, but the features were pretty much the same. So we were not bringing qualitatively different results. Yeah. That, that's the thing. So maybe your congestion is true. Maybe in this case, you don't be Yeah, because at the end, it's a free. You know, so right. it's a part. Right, right, right. 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 So the path you have a line. Yeah, I imagine that, yeah, I imagine that the algebra would be more complex. Yeah, it's only that. Yes, yes, right. yes. Well, but it's only Yeah, right. 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 No. Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you.